still late. Sorry, I would like to record your lecture. You're very welcome. <laughs> Stop working. <laughs> So, oh, okay. next one. Wait. Try it. Oh, yeah, it worked. So, so the first step is how to model the effect of a drug on the control control. Because that's my topic. I spent my time in the physiology lab studying ventral control. How do we and how do I interact with the ventral control system? And we started developing models to build our various. This is an example of a very simple model that we developed. By these models, you will find that we have a pharmacology, a pharmacologic component. This, for instance, is the effect of an oil opioids. We have seen the plasma concentrations. And we all it. Well, I will talk about it later, but we know that we all typically have when it comes into the brain stem. It, it crosses the brain barrier and then it has its effect on the ventilatory controller. But we always have to have to consider O2 and CO2 kinetics. And we discussed that later is one that is so incredibly important. It's mainly about time constants, but then time constants. And you can see the phone call that we have where well, there's based on ventilation. And in this kind of experiments, we look at the effect of CO2 in both CO2 and ventilatory response. And what we see here is that we have a part of the response that is CO2 independent, and then we have the VRT, which is the ventilatory recruitment threshold, where we see a linear increase in ventilation. And a drug can have an effect on any of these components, on based on ventilation, based on CO2, on the VRT, on the steepness of the slope, and the position of the slope. The position of the slope is defined by VRT. So then you see the effects that a drug can have. In this, in this experiment, we looked at the dynamics of all of these components separately, but most importantly, on the slope of the response. And you can see that the opioid has a big effect on the response slope, but it has little effect on the baseline points. I will get back to that later. Now we have multiple drugs, we can also model that. For instance, we have the interaction between propofol and the fentanyl on the entity control, and we find that propofol on the slope of the response. And you see that drugs that are sedatives, they have an effect on the slope. Well, all of that run through, they have an effect on I mean, this part and this part at the time we use the, sorry, this part, the term VRT, but it shifts the response slope to the right. So different drugs have different effects on the ventilatory response, and they all come with their own dynamics. That is really, really important. Mind you, it's not only the brainstem where these drugs have effects. There's also a very important sensor, and that's the creative body. The creative body is our sensor for oxygen and CO2. And this, the, the creative body is the application of the common creative artery. You can see the of that. You can see the environment to show you where the models the creative bodies are. You can see and the first this is a patient with a quote about the tool, so called Grove's tool. The interesting part of this talk is that O2, oxygen, and CO2, they interact. They both interact actively, but in a multiplicative way. And the various drug interactions on especially on that, that special interactive component. And as you can see, we model the saturation, not the saturation of PO2, because saturation is linearly related to ventilation. And of course, CO2. And the higher the CO2, the greater the hypoxic ventilatory response. Now, in this case, we're modeling. Like a shield, this is a depressive effect on ventilation and stimulant. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, in that story, stimulant. They interact on this interactive component of the creative body. However, I have been talking so far on respiratory depression from drugs, propofol, I discussed opioids. But given the fact that we're not facing a I'm not saying a global opioid crisis. I personally would say it's, it's a problem of the United States. But then we started to understand 
that the effect of drugs, the effect of opioids on ventilatory control is not that important. It is the fact that that's the first step, because when you're ventilatory depressed, you become asphyxic. Your CO2 rises and your O2 goes down. And these two components that have a detrimental effect on the cardiac output. And um, you die because your heart stops. You do not die because you stop breathing. Only when you do not have any more cardiac output, you die. So to get with the FDA, this is a paper that we wrote together with the FDA, I'm currently collaborating with them on the same topic, to start to do an experiment. This is an experiment performed by um, one of my um, PhD students, he's here with us today, Martin van Lennon, and he wrote, you can see that there's a rise in cardiac output, the rise is dictated by the increase in CO2. And I'll give you a look and we see that cardiac output goes back to baseline. And this is exactly what we have to do with other that we are talking about with um, the PFDA. But we'll talk about it a little bit later. So we moved on from effect of drugs on ventilatory control to the effect of drugs on the cardiac system, because we believe that that is much, much more important than anything else. Now, We've been talking a little bit on, on the effect of drugs on ventilation. My question to myself or to us all is the effect of opioids on ventilation. You might say, well, is it, isn't it easy to just measure ventilation? Well, it isn't that easy. But there's ways how to um, measure um, um, when you just say an opioid, for example. Comes from the Greek word procurus, which means variable. You give somebody an opioid and you just look at the CO2. You see the CO2 rise and you say, well, that's it. Ventilation might go down a bit. I think that's not the best way to do it. I will explain it to you later. You could also do it isocapnic, in which you raise the entire CO2, keep it constant, give the opioid, and you see only the effect of the opioid in ventilation. CO2 is clamped. There's no confounding effect from changes in CO2 on ventilation. You just look at the effect of the opioid on the movements in the brain. But you can also combine the two. In fact, you can make a technique study in which you just have the CO2 increase, but consider O2 and CO2 kinetics to, to take into account to consider the effect of CO2 as well. You might say, well, is that important? Just give the opioids like. This study from 2001 in the name of but she wants you increased activity or fentanyl using the T-cell system, and she wants it, and she wants it to it, and she did some uh, people, and she came to a C-50, for instance, fentanyl of 6 nanograms per ml. So she only wanted to she, she took um, at the CO2 not into account. So you might say, okay, I believe that. But six nanograms per mile, that's quite high up. But we believe that fentanyl is quite a safe opioid. Extremely safe. Because it's really hard. You can ask Martin, he's, he's experienced quite difficult to get that high up. We do differently. We perform studies at isohypercapnia. So we increase the PCO2. A time level of beyond 20 minutes. You can see that there is no such thing in the x axis is the y axis concentration. You can see the after the CO2 was clamped at around 50 millimeters of mercury. And if you do that, and you measure the PC50 by the PKPD modeling, you find that the potency of the operator has increased by a factor of six because now the um, the EC50 is one nanogram per mil. So, big difference between poikilo technique with, and as, and still you might say, nah, bullshit. We shut it off for the poikilo technique. However, guys, when we perform poikilo technique experiments, the endpoint, the result of the study, is context sensitive. And one of the most important things is. It's then becomes dependent on your experimental conditions. For instance, how speedy you inject the opioid. If you give it slowly or speedy. And why is that? Well, imagine this. This is a different experiment. This is 
Because you injected it so speedy, there's a big peak concentration in plasma. There's a rapid crossing of the opioid into the brain compartment, and it silences the respiratory neurons in the brainstem well before there is sufficient increase of CO2 to sustain breathing. If you do this, if you do the same amount of fentanyl, but much, much, much slower, same amount, you see that it goes very slowly in the pregnancy, it increases in the top and there's a little So this is the big difference between performing isocapnic experiments in which you have to correct um, C15 compared to proteolocapnic, because in proteolocapnic experiments, I'm sorry, you cannot see it, the C15 is dependent on the speed of injection. And we published this already 30 years ago, almost 40. And I might say, is this relevant? Absolutely. We are performing experiments again together with the FDA, might perform these experiments in which we have somebody that well, we overdosed him on the very safe conditions with an opioid, and you can see he's building a opioid, how much it's very short period of illegal reading, and all the symptoms that we shared it also. In terms of naloxone, and the subject resumed breathing. This is what happens in real life a very speed injection of the opioid. This is what all these people that die of an opioid, a massive opioid overdose do. They die because their ventilation stops, they become hypoxic, and their heart stops. Now, another one that is really, really important, and I spoke already about it, if you look at the CO2 response slope, X axis, there's the effect side concentration, effect side CO2 concentration, the Y axis is ventilation. You can see this is an opioid. This is the response slope before the opioid. If you look at the slope, the maximum decrease in slope occurred after two hours after this slope came back. If you look at basin ventilation, basin ventilation peaked after four hours. So the dynamics of CO2 so dependent and independent ventilation are very, very different. But if you want to have the most sensitive marker, biomarker of opioid effect on reading, it's my opinion you have to look at CO2 dependent ventilation. This is V55, which is the ventilation with an extrapolated PCO2 55 and the of mercury. So there are big differences. Outcome when you perform your experiments. By the way, just to complete the picture, this is a slowly occurring overdose. This occurred in the recovery. This is data from Frank Overdog, who gave that to me. And this subject, this patient was overdosed with a PCO morphine by chance um, of use the um, CO2 tracing. We can see that in that movie, there's to second, there's to apnea. Very different from the rapid overdose that I showed you before. Now, what is so intriguing, intriguing to me, this is something that I also saw in the Prodigy trial, in which many patients were traced with CO2 monitoring post operatively, that respiratory depression in the clinical setting hardly ever is shown by an increase in antidote CO2. It's off, it, of course, it's, it, there's a big difference between arterial and antidote CO2. But we do not see the hypercapnia that people talk about so much. Next step, next project that we did. So far, we only discussed opioid related respiratory depression. However, opioids have multiple effects, they have multiple side effects, and they also have benefits. They produce analgesia. So, how can we come up with one measure that combines both? The analgesic effect and the harmful effects of opioids. I wouldn't say that exists because we have the therapeutic index that looks at the ratio of C50 for one endpoint versus the C50 of the other endpoint. And I show you that here. Here we have concentration of 
what are some facts on the rest of the question and the treatment of and the deception. And you combine that this time you have the therapeutic index. However, the therapeutic index is just one number depicting the effect at C50 of the other At other concentrations, the therapeutic index will be very different because these two curves are in parallel. So it's a very limited indicator of a combined effect. So moving back to the literature, um, and we started looking at what we call the utility or safety function. And that's absolutely not the It comes from the session theory, and um, it's used in multiple facets of, of science. It's, more, it's used in economics. In economics, it's quite clear how it works. You have a, um, a probability um, of benefit. For instance, if you buy a bread, let's, let's, let's do that. You go to the store, you buy bread. What is the benefit if you buy bread? Well, that you survive. You can eat, you live. But what's the harm? It costs you money. So for every action that we take, there's a benefit and a harm, really, for almost everything that we do. So also in medicine, if you treat somebody, so a sugar and women, they need to anti intensive therapy. Others have looked at anticoagulant therapy. Always there was a benefit and harm for therapy. And we started looking several years later on the of energy, the probability of hospital depression, very much like Louis Schaller uh, defined his utility and benefit minus risk. We did the same thing. We took an example. This is how you should calculate the utility function. Extremely complex, you think, how they need it. Um, we, can, we published it um, a few years ago. It's all based on PKPD modeling. However, nowadays also can calculate uh, the utility function without PKPD modeling. We call this utility function, and it is possible, it looks very much alike. An example, this is the utility of the probability of analgesia minus the probability of respiratory depression for fentanyl. There's a balance of fentanyl, and you see that the utility becomes negative, then it becomes zero. On the right side, same curve, but now as a function of effects of concentration, and we can see there that the uh, utility of fentanyl is predominantly negative, but there's always a higher likelihood of Respiratory depression than analgesia. Well, is that always the case? No. There are some drugs that show a difference, a distinction in utility. And one such drug is omicerodine. We published this a few years ago in anesthesiology, in which we show that compared to morphine, the utility of omicerodine is positive. Again, it's on peak, performed in. Health and volunteers, these experiments. Why is that? Why are the two that differ so much? Well, we claim that it has to do with the fact that conventional methods interact with two inter intracellular pathways, the, the, the G protein copper pathway and the beta western copper pathway, while oliceridine has a bias towards the G protein pathway. And my opinion is that increase of the reduces, that's what I have to say, it reduces the likelihood of a respiratory depression event if you do that. That's all I'm saying. We have performed a validation study, also published, in which we looked at post-operative patients treated with one drug, oliceridine, or the other one, the bias ligand, or the classical opioid morphine. This is an example of two subjects. Let me see this there. Mortality is uh, around 0.2. For now, for it's negative. The crosses are respiratory events, so respiratory pressure events. There's those uh, events. And that's the only thing that I wanted to, to discuss here or, or to tell you is that we observed that respiratory depression events occurred for almost well, just above 90% when utility was below 0.2. So we have the impression that utility does help us. So opioids that have a predominantly positive utility have a lesser likelihood of respiratory depression events. And by the way, this is a respiratory depression event. It's a hypoxemia event. Is that the same as respiratory depression? No. Desaturation, saturation by itself, is a measure of gas exchange in the lungs. 
It's not a measure of opioid or drug-induced depression of respiration. That's something that you need to know. So I believe that this has a high chance of a so-called VQ mismatch event. And then Sessler's group sometimes ago already showed that patients post-optively have prolonged periods of hypoxemia with low saturation levels, especially overnight. And I consider that all VQ mismatch event. Well, we can play with this utility function. You can so far I showed you that we calculated the likelihood of harm or energy shadows harm, but you can play with that. You can still say what is the importance of energy shadows between what is the energy shadow harm, etc. etc. But there's one but also, the utility function is context sensitive because you need to define beforehand what you call analgesia and what you call restoral depression. What is analgesia? And what is restoral depression? How much decline in ventilation do you call restoral depression? So you can with these thresholds. And if you say, you know, the threshold is very low, you have a very positive function. But if you say, I want 100% analgesia on all of my subjects, well, then the curve evidently becomes negative. So you can play with it, but it's very intuitively, uh, I like it very much. So far, I spoke about restful depression, but you can use any negative endpoint, well, any positive endpoint as well for the opioid. Here we compare um with uh, more cognitive um, impairment. We looked at velocity. So this is tracing of the eye of a dot on the screen. And we looked at body sway, body sway as a marker of ability to mobilize or to become dizzy when you get up. Because the biggest problem of opioids is not rest of depression, by the way. The biggest problem of opioids people, elderly people when they get up, get dizzy, fall. On the floor, break their hips. Bigger, bigger issue than rest of depression. Now, the last slide on this topic is that I show you again uh, one drug with two effects analgesia and rest of depression, a therapeutic index of one. What does that mean? Little because the utility is negative over the clinical dose range. So I believe that the utility has very more information than the therapeutic index. But the final topic, maybe the most important one. Um, we started a line of research in reversal of opioid-induced restful depression related to the opioid pandemic, the opioid crisis in the United States. And we were approached by the FDA to do that. And we got a large award from the FDA to study that together with them. So the studies that you will see now are in close collaboration with the FDA. One thing we need to analyze, and this is a very schematic description of what happens to an opioid when it's injected into the body. First of all, it is um, it, well, it distributes across all of the tissues. The final part crosses the blood brain barrier and then it interacts with the receptor. But what we need to realize is that it's one very important factor, that's receptor kinetics. And one of the most important uh, parameters that from PKDD model is parameter k off, which is the, um, the, the off um, constant of the, um, uh, of the opioids. So the opioid has a um, constant that defines the attachment to the receptor, and there's a, a constant that defines the ability of the opioid to detach from the receptor, and that's KF. The smaller KF, the more difficult it is for the opioid to detach from the receptor. And you might say, well, don't all opioids have the same KF? No, they do not. KF reflects a little bit with affinity. So a very small KF um, indicates a very high affinity. Well, I will tell you, these opioids, the opioids that we have differ tremendously in the value of KF. The smallest value of KF is for carfentanil. So if carfentanil goes, attaches to the receptor, it's almost impossible to get it off the receptor, especially it's impossible for naloxone to get it off the receptor. But also, other opioids have a very low KF value. Carfentanil has a low value. So fentanyl has a low value. This are the three ones with the lowest value. But I was also surprised by the low value of morphine. I'll show you that on the right side. 
if you overdose, or if you, you don't overdose, if you give a and see the pressure of ventilation, and you give it so, for milligrams, you can see that a very delicious orange, which is based on ventilation, it takes around 20 minutes before it gets to the peak. And even if you triple the dose of naloxone, give it four times higher, the speed at which this occurs does not change. So the affinity defines the speed at which you are able to overcome the opioid induced respiratory depression, the speed at which the reversal agent works. So you can already predict that the speed is the size for a car fentanyl, followed by the fentanyl. So this is an example that we performed. Uh, from when we performed this experiment, and what we did is we gave um, a volunteer. Um, infusion with sufentanil, we see the increase in CO2. We give 40 grams of intramesal naloxone, and we see that the CO2 declines back to baseline almost, but it takes 30 minutes. But then I ask you, do we really need to go back to baseline with CO2? How much reversal is needed to sustain somebody's life? Well, you can calculate that because you need a certain amount of oxygen flux in the tissues, which is the amount of oxygen that passes to the tissues, for instance, to the heart, to the brain, and they're unable to sustain life. And that's around 40% of baseline. So you have around five to 10 minutes before we reach that 30% level. That's really, really important. You don't need a complete reversal. You need just 40% of baseline. Okay? But what's also something that you see here is that naloxone, it works out of 30 minutes, then it wears out. It has a very short half life. So we call this renal cutization. But you, you need to be aware of that. So, we, we, especially when you have sustained infusion, high dose infusion, someone with overdoses with massive dose of fentanyl, laced with carfentanil, he will have a renal cutization way earlier than 30 minutes. So, this is the same for, and we'll skip this one for fentanyl. And in our recent study, this study will be published soon in the Ghana Metropolitan that we did with the FDA again, looked at how much naloxone is needed to get the highest peak concentration in plasma. And we looked at this is what's in the, in the package insert every two minutes, you get four milligrams in nasal, or you can get eight milligrams, eight milligrams, or you can get just two doses. And what we discovered from this, this data is that give as much naloxone as early as possible. You don't have to bother again because there's no additional effect of the naloxone. If you gave too little, the likelihood is very high that your subject, your patient will die. If you give sufficient, don't give anything else because you don't need it. You might say, is this true? Well, this, again, I showed you this before, but I want to show you this. This is what we did. We took the data that I just showed you and we looked at the probability of cardiac arrest. So we went, I have to go back. So we went to this model and we looked at cardiac output. It said when cardiac output would be zero. That's what we did. And if you give, if, if someone overdoses on a high dose of fentanyl here on top, let's say 3 milligrams intravenously, 3,000 micrograms. You have 80% likelihood of a cardiac arrest and death. If you give in four doses of rapid um, naloxone, so this is four doses of four milligrams intranasal naloxone, you see that the effect um, has improved tremendously. The likelihood of a cardiac arrest is now around 35%. But now, if you give this subject intravenous naloxone, you can see that the effect improves tremendously. So we go from intranasal to intravenous, and we improve our outcome tremendously. However, if you find somebody on the street, he has no IV, so we give him intranasal. We give him, in my opinion, we give him 8 milligrams, 4 milligrams in one nostril and 4 milligrams in the other, because there is saturation in uptake, mind you. 
But carfentanil, of course, the story is even worse because carfentanil is such a high affinity for the receptor. The probability of death is almost, well, it's just above 90%. If you don't do anything, and you can see the difference here, but you can also see that you need to dose high up. There's one problem with this model. Well, there, there are many problems. It's of course, important. but the biggest problem that I believe occurs here is that we gave the naloxone quite early on. We know that an overdose, and within two to three minutes, we reversed this simulated subject. What happens in your life? Somebody overdoses and it takes 20, 30 minutes before you find him. So we have to start doing that. I think this is it's a good idea, but okay. We spoke about naloxone. Well, naloxone has many limitations. I spoke on the short duration. I spoke on the fact that it's very difficult for naloxone to reverse high affinity opioids. And another big, big problem, it's unable to reverse non-opioids. And many of the individuals that overdose on an opioid currently have other drugs on board, like xylosine or benzodiazepines, whatever. And these drugs also are very potent respiratory depressants. And we are now performing a whole set of experiments on what we call agnostic respiratory stimulants. These are drugs that stimulate the ventilatory control system without interacting with the main opioid receptor system. So it causes respiratory uh, stimulation through other causes, through other interactions, through other receptor systems. So we have TRH, we studied that. While in animals, we can reverse opioid-induced respiratory depression. We call it in humans or vaccine. So I also have experiments, again, performed by um, it could reverse the orexin agonist caused potent Western stimulation. However, I have to say one limitation was that the level of Western pressure was not tremendous, was not a massive opioid overdose. Drugs that interact with the system are so cognizant. Everyone can, but I'm literally worried about the side effects of ketamine. The fact that ketamine itself is very addictive. A very interesting drug is M01, previously called GAL021, which is a drug that interacts with the creative bodies. It mimics hypoxia. So the cells think they're hypoxic by blocking potassium channels and you get a massive um, hyperventilatory response showing the essence uh, that's also very strong on the right side. This is the stimulation from N001 propofol induced depression of the hypoxic ventilatory response. We're unable to show significant effects with doxaphorin a drug that makes a little bit of effect. And currently we're investigating um, Oh, sorry, I'm going too fast, guys. Sorry for that. I want one back. Is it possible? Can we do that? Yeah, I think. No, this is. Oh, let's. let's... The one after this one. Yes. yes. This is the Almec story. This is one subject, and this is, this is a blinded study. I have no idea what, what I was given, but just to show you what we do, we give fentanyl, we take up the dose, that's our ventilation or ventilation crisis. The problem there is entitled CO2, that's our ideal CO2. You can see that with the fentanyl, and you can see that, remember, CO2 rises, might be true, might not be true. We saw some stimulation, so C2 didn't rise that much. Very interesting concept, and there are new molecules being developed that are much more potent than anomic um, interacts with the redox status uh, of the neurons in the brain. Okay, I'm almost done. Two things. One, we, we've been speaking about um, healthy volunteers so far. We also have a very um, prophetic line of research in individuals with an opioid use disorder. And the first thing that we did is we compared their opioid sensitivity. And we observed that the opioid sensitivity of these individuals was much more less compared to healthy volunteers. Very interesting. Still, these individuals use very high amounts of opioids. Five milligrams of fentanyl is, is not uncommon in our lab. 
And at these very high doses, there's still the probability of um, severe respiratory depression of apnea, asphyxia, and a cardiac arrest. Mind you, these people use such high dosages. It's, it's tremendous. Another thing is that the development of tolerance to opioids has very different dynamics for respiratory depression than for any other effect. It's much slower to develop. And when you have a drug holiday, for instance, incarceration, during, due to incarceration or any other um, opioid holiday, the tolerance is lost quite quickly. So an upcoming dose of an opioid has a very high likelihood of killing these individuals. Finally, I spoke about these high affinity opioids. And I believe, and with me others, that you can use these high affinity opioids to treat, um, to prevent opioid induced respiratory depression. This is a study that we published in GCI uh, just a year ago. And if you go to the right side, and we'll show it to you here, this in red is the concentration of people often, like I said, an opioid with a high affinity for the receptor. If you do that and you give multiple high doses, high bolus doses of fentanyl, you can see that despite a little bit of ventilator depression, the fentanyl effect was almost absent in contrast to individuals that did not have the promorphine on board. So there's a whole body of research ongoing in which we can, you know, you can give people an idea as patch, but you can also give it as a depot. And it's subjects that have been going to a um, um, substance abuse treatment center, and then they get a, a depot just before they leave the center. Because mind you, 50% of people that claim that they're clean after treatment go directly to their dealer. 50%. Yeah, it's really, really sad. Well, I've come to the end of my presentation, but mind you guys, this is not my work alone, far from it. I'm, I'm really, I consider myself with a time together with these great people that are part of my team. She's my study manager. My week, she's head of our um, clinic, and, and she got her PhD from Rutgers, head of the Respiratory Lab, who is really, really smart in designing all kinds of devices. And she's got her PhD from me. She's our head of the department. Um, she's one of the first people to discover the fact that opioids affect men and women quite um, differently. My time is heading. The, 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 the research is well, but the most important, Eric Olofsson, is the most brilliant guy and does all of our uh, PKP modeling. I thank you very much. Well, out of respect for the time, uh, if you have questions for Albert, please approach him while we uh, enjoy another uh, refreshment. And I want to just say thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With this? Go get the Thank you. How are you? I have to tell you, for this extremely incredible thing that every time you guys play with something, I think that's the way we should really be doing it. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs>